Welcome to Ozcast, the platform where we take a deep dive into the science and research behind the issues impacting Australian waterways. Each week, we team up with experts in their field to take a look below the surface. G'day and welcome to Ozcast. On this episode, I team up with Gary Kendrick from the UWA's Ocean Institute to talk all about seagrass. Now, in this episode, we touch on not just the history and importance of seagrass, but the methods of restoring seagrass both here in Australia and overseas. Now, Gary is one of the leading names both domestically and internationally and offers a bunch of insight into the successes and failures that he's had in his 40 plus year career. It's a long conversation, but it is an interesting one, particularly with how important seagrass is right now in mainstream media. Without any further ado, here's Gary Kendrick in Perth talking on seagrass. Well, Gary, welcome to Ozcast. It is a pleasure to have you on. I must admit, um, out of all the uh, interviewees we proposed at the start of this series, your name was was pretty high up there, and for good reason. You've been in the game for a long, long time, and you've been dealing um, with, I guess, a, a, a habitat that particularly at Ozfish we are we are interested in, and we've spent a lot of time and energy in, and that and that is seagrass. So, firstly, you know, thanks for coming on. You're welcome. What's it like being? Uh, being called the seagrass guy you know i hate to to put it so colloquially but uh you know when i was you know i do ring around and ask your colleagues and people in the industry i really want to find someone uh you know both male or female um on who is the uh the credible source to talk on seagrass not only seagrass you know generally but on seagrass restoration in australia And, and it must you know feel great to know that your name was was mentioned you know nearly every single occasion so a lot of people you know are modest and they don't like to admit that but I, you surely got to be proud with that. Oh, I am. And uh, I am the seagrass guy. So it makes sense. <laughs> uh, I, uh, I have an I- immense history with seagrass. I've been in the business now um, for a long time and seagrass have featured all the time. In, uh, when I was four and a half years old and I learned how to swim by jumping off a jetty over at Garden Island, which is uh, south of Perth, um, what did I jump into? A seagrass meadow. And my interest has always been piqued by what I call the backdrop. You know, if you go to a play, you'd look at the actors in front. And underwater, those actors are always the fish or the invertebrates, but mostly the fish. You know, colourful, they're always moving around. Everybody knows what they're called. No one knows what's behind them. And what's behind them is the base for the whole food chain that makes their life easy. And seagrasses and seaweeds are the two components that make up that environment. When I was really young and I started diving, I, I, by the way, I learned how to dive from a clearance diver for the Australian Navy. <laughs> it was pretty funny. We all were dressed in um, woolly jumpers. Get this, woolly jumpers. Um, we were swimming in the Swan River, which is an estuary in the middle of winter. And the temperatures were around 12 degrees Celsius. And guess what was on the bottom? Seagrass. seagrass. Would you believe it? <laughs> there were a lot of blowfish as well, but, uh, you know, we, we put up with those. And the, the joke was that as soon as I did the first dive, I realised where I was going in my career. I was going into the marine environment and I was going to try and use, at that time, scuba to do all my work because I just loved being underwater. Now, why seagrass? You know, why not um, other systems? Mm. Coral reef, for instance. Um, the reason I chose seagrass is because it occupies, especially in West Australia, a, a, a vast area of coverage from your estuaries all the way out to your deep ocean. So we've got seagrass meadows down to um, 55 to 60 metres off our coast. And we have a very, very broad um, continental shelf in WA or West Australia. And um, it's... There's always seagrass out there. So it's uh, one of the conversations I like having, particularly with people in your position, is that there had to have been a point early in your career or your mm-hmm. your studies where uh, you know you were looking quite broadly at marine science, and then at one point you would have had to have you know slowly and incrementally transition into being you know seagrass focused. Um, you know th- this could happen in a range of forms, and you know some some people have said there was an event that triggered it, or a, a particular trip in, in university that really triggered the interest. Where did when did seagrass first come on the radar for you? Not just an interest, but as a career, as a as a focus point in your in your studies and your research. 
Um, I, the first time it became a focus point was in 1982 when I went to Shark Bay with a researcher, Diana Walker. <clears throat> Professor Walker was actually has been my mentor most of my career. Uh, she's the same age as me, which is really cool. Um, and we explored the wild country that was Shark Bay back in the early 80s. And it was uh, about 4,000 square kilometres of seagrass that we were exploring. And give you an idea, 4,000 square kilometres, I mean, that's a huge area. It's actually hard to quantify, but if you want to think about it, it's like pouring eight to ten Sydney harbours into one place, and it's covered with seagrass. Mm. So I saw the diversity of seagrasses, but also the the continuum me continuous meadows that spread over large areas at that point. Um, and I, back in nine, 2011, actually, I went back to Shark Bay, and I've been working in Shark Bay since. And the reason I've been doing that is because of the impacts of climate change on that system. We uh, lost close to 1,000 square kilometres of seagrasses, uh, well, 980 something or other clo uh, square kilometres. Now, when we're talking square kilometres, uh, you know, it's a that's a big number. So think of it as hundreds, thousand hectares. So that's a big farm. Mm. <laughs> that's how big the loss was in 2011 during the extreme heat wave that hit the West Australian coastline at that time. And you know, the uh, the outcome of that was both com uh, losses commercially and losses to biodiversity and changes to systems that haven't returned a decade later. So uh, I got very interested in the loss at that point and very interested at the same time as what can we do about it? What can we as individuals in a, in a community do to help deal with the scale of loss that's going on in systems out there? Um, and in this case, it was climate event driven. Uh, many instances, seagrasses are lost because they like living in sheltered environments. And guess who likes living along sheltered environments? Humanity. Mm. So we, uh, let's just say, we are the biggest destroyer of seagrasses. On the, um, and generally, globally, we're losing about one soccer field of seagrasses every 30 minutes. I remember when I first heard that statistic um, in an interview you did a, a, two years ago, and I, I thought it was a like a typo or a mistake because you can't fathom that you can't mm. you know you try think about what you've just said a soccer field or a football field or wherever you're listening an nfl field every 30 minutes yeah that is that is absurd 48 hectares a, a day a loss globally that's just uh, amazing and much of the loss is in areas that can't afford the loss so, you know, one of the other interesting thing is 90% of the, the world's population live within uh, of tens of kilometres of coastlines. Mm. And many of the world's population are impoverished and are dependent on these seagrass meadows mm -hmm. in the coastal zone. I'm interested to get more into these statistics um, very shortly because these are what this is what I want to dive into. You know, the the tagline of the podcast is beneath the surface. So let's just park that for two minutes. So back in the '80s, when yep. you said you you kind of were first introduced, what was a snapshot of seagrass like in Australia then? So obviously the '80s, you know, a few decades ago now, surely it's changed significantly. So back then was was a problem recognised in the '80s? Was was the decline in seagrass? You know. Was it accepted in the industry that it was would it, that it was declining, or is it something that's more, you know, two thousands plus that we've gone? No, there's a problem. You know, wh when was the awareness that that we need to do something about seagrass in Australia? The awareness started in the eighties. In the eighties. <clears throat> um, to give you an example, the um, Coburn Sound is uh, one of the most recorded losses. About three thousand hectares were lost from Coburn Sound through industrialisation of Coburn Sound. It's the outer port to Fremantle, and it's also the large area of industrialisation along the coast. And um, <clears throat> sorry about the cough. <clears throat> um, what we saw in that system was a change from a benthic-driven system with lots of seagrasses to an area that had lots of phytoplankton blooms, including toxic phy phytoplankton blooms, red tides, and. Um, I was my first job out of university was actually working on Co on the Coburn Sound. So this was in the late seventies, 
the report came out, the government tried to close the report down, state governments like that, um, and the it was released and out of that came a complete change in the system. They started controlling nutrient inputs and, and pollutants um, in a big way. The Coburn Sound went from one of the cheapest ports in Australia to one of the most expensive to work on environmental cost. And at the time, uh, I was working with the seagrass researchers at that point, but I didn't really want to work on seagrasses because everybody works on seagrasses. But at that time, we started playing around with restoration. So the first attempts at restoring seagrasses were in these mu very highly changed systems like Coben Sound. Um, and what we found over the years is actually you're wasting your time. You've got to get the light climate, you've got to get the uh, nutrient climate down and the light climate up and then you've got this beautiful environment where you can grow seagrasses. If, you gr if seagrasses are colonising naturally, that's where we should put our effort. We shouldn't be putting our effort where there's just a blank, sandy, uh, lifeless uh, mm. bottom. In comparison to other habitats like s shellfish, snags, you know, all the different ones we, we talk about in the, in the marine conservation world, I would say the 80s is quite late for us to recognise a problem, right? And, and tell me what you think of this theory. But, you know, if we, if we talk about something like shellfish, for example, we consumed shellfish. You know, we harvested them for, for food, but then also <coughs> for building, for, for, yeah. for lime, right? But seagrass, you, can't, you don't eat. Well, I'm sure people you know, do eat it. But naturally, it's not a, you know, conventionally, it's not a food source for humans, right? And secondly, we don't really harvest it for anything. Do you think that's got to do with the fact that, you know, we first were starting to talk about a problem in the 80s as opposed to the 30s or the 40s or the 50s? Well, I remember my grandfather um, being very angry about the black water. The black water was where the seagrass grew, not the sandy beach. And, uh, but at the same time, that black water produces a lot of the juvenile fish that we actually catch. So in terms of a fisheries resource, especially the estuarine seagrasses, are extremely productive. Mm. So you've got to be uh, in this business, you've got to look beyond the actual use of the product um, directly. You've got to look at its total value and the total value for fisheries, the total value for carbon burial, the total value for biodiversity conservation, the total value for... Uh, seahorses, for instance, let's just pick an organism, mm. um, and pipefish. Uh, the seagrasses are the are the place, and along with a reef. But you know, really, it's it's this large expense, uh, expanse of seagrasses that are actually the juvenile habitat for many organisms. Mm. The black water you're referring to is that is that? Are you painting a picture there of when you look into the water? Yeah, just the, when you look in the water. There's a dark zone. Yeah, and that's what your grandfather was referring to as the you know the spot to be if you wanted to. There's a spot to catch fish, to catch but, fish but, but you didn't want to jump into it because you didn't know what was on the bottom. Interesting. Isn't it funny that that's how we referred to it as the, you know, the, the black water? And yeah. it is right. If you look at drone, you know, drone technology these days is a huge part of what you do, I'm sure. You know, yeah. in the last 10 years, look, being able to look at you know, mooring scars and, and we'll get to a, a lot of that shortly. But you're right. It, it looks like black water. Yeah, exactly. So, um, you, you've spoke, you've touched on it briefly, but look, what was your before we move on to you know the the, the nitty gritty of seagrass? What was your did you PhD? What what was your focus study? Okay, my my uh, I'm a, a bit of an oddity, right? So I wasn't going on to a PhD. I believe that you could get a job and do what you want just as a human being. Yep. Actually, I tried not to do the degree, but I did that. <laughs> um, and then I got very excited about doing a master's overseas. It, just remember, I'm talking about the late 70s in West Australia. And, you know, West Australia is, at that time was very waspish, white Australian Protestant um, ethic was really alive. Um, and we were very isolated in those days. So I just decided I was going to go overseas. I went to British Columbia, to Vancouver, British Columbia, and really got into seaweeds. So I was studying the life history of various seaweeds when I was in, in Vancouver. That got me to work for the, uh, uh, the National Park Service of the USA, and I worked at Olympic National Park on the coastlines, looking at seaweed distribution and invertebrate distributions on intertidal platforms. The specific question was, how can we stop the loss of intertidal platforms from overzealous fishermen coming and collecting bait from them? Right. So here we are in a national park with a 
jurisdictional issue around the intertidal because that's state, not national. Mm -hmm. And uh, the fishers were coming down, not all of them, just a few guys that were pretty hungry for bait and they'd pour bleach onto the intertidal platform and so the worms would jump out. And, wow. and <laughs> I would like to say the science we did made a difference and the boundaries were changed in the park because of that. But really, it was the phot photography of people doing this in front of um, visitors from other places of the world coming down to look at the intertidal platform as part of the national park. So, um, uh, yeah, that was my first experience that you can make a big difference with a good photo, um, especially at, at, um, in, in the USA. So that was in 1981, mm -hmm. so a long time ago, before some of us are born. Yeah. <laughs> Guilty. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> even in then, it's the, the art of um, expressing what is going on visually as well as using signs that mm. actually got that change. From that point, I went on to, uh, I worked in uh, southern, um, southern places. I went to Texas. I went to Texas A&M and worked on uh, Antarctic diatoms, of all things, and looked at Antarctic productivity in the melting ice shelves of every austral spring in, in Antarctica. Loved it, but it wasn't big enough for me. Mm -hmm. So I went down to uh, Galapagos. Spent a year in Galapagos really looking at uh, impacts, human impacts to the system. And part of my work was really looking at the effect of port facilities on the biodiversity of benthic organisms. Um, and that was phenomenal. I mean, when you swim in the Galapagos and you've got Amblyrhynchus cristatus, the, the marine iguana swimming next to you, or these flightless cormorants enjoying your environment, it's all of a sudden, you, you, yeah, it's, it's what I would say is cream opportunities to enjoy life yeah. at the most and work at the same time. From Antarctica and from uh, the Galapagos, I came back to West Australia with a, with a goal of really influencing how we use our science in policy making. I came back to a world that was probably 20 years behind the US in this, this approach, West Australia, um, and the advice given to me by the conservation uh, director at the time was, don't waste your time, go and do some good science. So I decided to go do some good science. I went off and uh, looked at everything and said, I want to go to Rottnest. For Rottnest Island is 20 kilometres off the coast of West Australia. It is beautiful if you haven't been there, so go if you get a yeah. chance. Um, and I said, I want to spend a week, a month, to two weeks a month at Rottnest Island. So what can I study over at Rottnest Island? <laughs> so let's just say very selfish reasons. <laughs> I was very dis disillusioned with what I was trying to do. So I went to Rottnest Island. There are major um, issues about utilisation of the resources over there. Um, but I studied a little brown algae called Sargassum. It's that one you find on the beach with the little bubbles that you pop. Mm. So it's brown, it mm -hmm. looks like it's got leaves on it, and it's got these little round bubbles. And uh, as a child, I used to walk down the beach and pop the bubbles all the time. So when I got there um, and I started my studies, I just realised uh, just how little we knew about the seasonal changes in those systems, including I also studied seagrass at that time over there for my, my colleague, um, and got pretty interested in that interaction between reefs seagrasses you know and also the trophic interactions that were going on so where were the fish going what were they feeding on uh, and also you know what was the seasonality and availability of the, the food resource mm -hmm. um, anyway from there I went to CSIRO got lost in CSIRO for three years and left <laughs> um, yeah sometimes you make decisions in life that don't go anywhere um, and then I was invited back to look at the ecological significance of seagrasses in Owen Anchorage and Coburn Sound. And that's where it started. And that's where my whole career started. Yeah. I think it's important to paint that picture for people because a lot of people are, who are looking to, to, you know, hear or learn about seagrass, you know, particularly from me, who's not in the industry, uh, you know, in the academic industry, I want to know that I'm, I'm hearing from someone who is, who is 
quite literally dove headfirst into this particular topic in which in which you have and and when you first you know give us a, a rough uh, timeline how many years have you been have you spent on on researching and, and looking at seagrass well since 1981 you can do the sums i think that's there you go yeah we'll let the people at home 42 do the <laughs> 40 okay let's say 40 years looking so that so that leads us into you know today's topic which is the importance and restoration of seagrass and i'm really excited to dive into it um you mentioned it at the, at the outset. Let's look at the issues. So in 1980, you know, the conversation started that we're losing seagrass and at a significant rate, right? Um, let's look at some of the reasons why that's happening um, then and then now because I can only imagine they've changed as, you know, we've developed as, you know, as, you know we're building more and, uh, you know, we're dredging more and, and whatnot. But we also might have, you know, t turned the narrative a little bit because of, public awareness and restoration programs and things. So back in the 80s, you mentioned it briefly, building on waterways and building in and around those coastal inshore reefs. Uh, that has to be one of the, you know, the primary reasons why we're lose we, we lost so much and are losing so much. And then let's take it from there as to what else has contributed to the decline of seagrass in Australia. So the, the major declines in the 80s were eutrophication, which is increasing nutrients in the water, associated uh, in those days it was really associated with sewerage outfalls and um, fertilizer factories um, the, what happens when you add more nutrients to a water body is there's a lot of competition for nutrients between the algae and the seagrass and the algae always win why is that they grow faster they're really hungry for nutrients they don't grow as much without them do they smother the seagrass yeah uh, algae smother it and also your phytoplankton take over the water column so all of a sudden you don't have enough light reaching the seagrasses they're smothered and the water column's more turbid now really <clears throat> a lot of our focus initially was on nutrients and light so a lot of the planning around the 1980s was to improve the reduce the nutrients increase the light and your seagrass will come back subsequent to that time we also realized it's the number of events that occur over time so if you're in a port development and you want to do a, a dredging activity, that's going to affect the light. If you're developing a new breakwater and it's changing the flow of uh, waves, uh, the, how they rebound off the original breakwater, you're going to lose seagrasses. If you put an anchor down, uh, you'll pull up a few bits and pieces, but if you put a mooring down, you're going to lose a lot more seagrass over time, especially if the mooring is rubbing on the bottom. So it's really the, uh, it's the combined effects of what we, uh, why we live near these water bodies that results in the outcome, which is loss of seagrass. So uh, we set up in West Australia a while back a policy for benthic habitats that's supplied by the EPA. So um, when an industry comes uh, to planning their, their work through an environmental uh, impact st uh, statement, they are, are given the, the policy and they have to replace what they lose. So that sort of changes how things get identified as issues. So, for instance, uh, if you want to put a new port development and you go through seagrass, it's going to cost you a lot of money to recover that seagrass. It's like mining on, on yeah. land, right? If you, if you but clear if you, forests, you yeah. have to restore that. Exactly. And really cool, though... It means that many, many of the developments try to figure how to have minimum impact on the bottom. It's that benthic po policies for corals as well. Right. Um, so that was a really nice step. You know, get the governance right, get the uh, laws right, and you can really control loss off. But as our population's grown, so has our need for coastal f f uh, facilities. And with that, I think we're just putting more and more pressure, even though we're being more environment, environmentally sensitive, we're still putting a lot more pressure on those systems. And that's really the problem, is you, you get into a position where you, you've got good environmental safeguards, but you've got a need, and it, it's a human need. And, and that, from that comes anthropogenic pressures on your estuaries and on your coastal seas. You've mentioned like coastal and inshore, you know, inshore populations of seagrass are quite a lot. Is that because they can only grow to a certain depth? You know, is 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 the reason they've suffered so much from what we've done as humans is because we inhabit the coastline and so does seagrass. You know, is the seagrass that can survive beyond where we can build? Are they are they doing all right? Okay. Um, 
great question. And <laughs> the reason it's a great question is I've told you about the light story. Mm. What we find is there's a, there's a combination of hydrodynamics, or sorry guys, I'll turn this into English, wave effect, tide effect, and light effect acting together. So uh, most seagrasses uptake uh, carbon from the water column, and they do it by uh, taking up bicarbonate ions or uh, CO2. And CO2 in the water is actually limited. It's more in the bicarbonate ion area. So they need wave or current across them to actually take up carbon, which they use for photosynthesis so that they can build you know, the building blocks of, 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 the, of them. So, you know, it's, it's that sort of model. What happens in an environment with too much wave energy or too much current energy is they can't stay on the bottom because it's constant movement of sediment, constant opportunity to rip them out of the bottom. Um, so seagrasses like calm environments, as do humans. <laughs> so they like calm environments. They can occur down, say, for instance, Coburn Sound, they occur down to 10, 15 metres depth, but they prefer that you know, three to five mm. metre depth but range. But 10, 15 is still shallow in my books, Yeah, knowing how deep the ocean can but get. But on West Australian coastline, we have uh, seagrasses growing out to 60 metres. Uh, these are called uh, continental shelf deep water seagrasses. They can occur in environments that have less than 5% light, um, you know, around about 1% light. Uh, there is one species that occurs on the West Australian coastline that is extensive. We're talking you know, thousands of square kilometres of this seagrass. It's, it's an annual, oh, well, it's not really, it's a perennial seagrass that has a seasonality. So uh, during certain months of the year, it loses its leaves, and other months of the year, it grows them back. And it's uh, Thalassodendron pachyrhizum. And recently we published on this and pointed out that it's quite common along our coastline. At those depths. So the West Australian coastline is quite different than the East Australian coastline in that we don't get a lot of upwelling and we don't have that East Australian current pushing um, uh, uh, offshore waters and cold waters onshore. What we do have um, is a continental shelf, low nutrients, extremely low nutrients, actually in some instances very hard to record, um, and we have crystal clear water, lots of benthic production or production on the rocks and the sand on the bottom but not a lot of pelagic production or in the water column. And what happens there is that um, seagrasses can get enough light to occur way out on the continental shelf. So More so than the east coast? More so. Well, way New more South so. Wales? No. Much, much, not at all. Right. But in the, uh, I guess in, in a lot of the literature, the, this idea that we've lost a significant amount of seagrass, would the data suggest that the majority of that has been quite... Inshore. inshore, whereas mm. the you know the example you mentioned before up to 40, 60 metres, they would presumably be doing all right because you know other than you know some rigs and and mining techniques we use offshore, there's been very little development out there, right? That would, the only impacts out there would be They're more would, the nutrients, global. yeah, right. So um, we have done very little study on these things because they occur so deep, yep. they'll be on the scuba diving exactly. regulations. Um, I'd like to dive them. Mm, that's a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe we need to put that one down. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, the uh, situation is we don't know. Mm. It's what we, we, we only recently found out we don't know. Mm -hmm. So we didn't know how extensive they were until very recently. Now the concern is what does climate change mean for these deep water um, seagrasses? And, that, and that's the thing we really don't know. Yeah. So you mentioned there, obviously, uh, urbanisation of uh, and building inshore mm -hmm. reefs, uh, this idea of wastewater outlets and, I guess, uh, lack of sunlight and the role nutrients and algae play in blocking the sunlight. I've re I read somewhere that a seagrass was once terrestrial. Oh, Yes. So, so that it, it, does that kind of does the, this demand and need for sunlight come from the fact that it, it is just a plant? You know, like it sounds quite simple, but I didn't realise that seagrass. Why do I need to say anything? You just <laughs> answer the question. Um, <laughs> I'm sure you can expand. <laughs> yeah, well, you know me. Um, yeah. <laughs> so let me just put it this. Thirty way. seconds. I'm going to no. thirty. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I can do it in ten. Yeah. Um, seagrasses are terrestrial or aquatic of or in origin. And they develop, they're one of the um, oldest groups of them, uh, what they call the monocots, the single cotyledon cells. 
uh, I'm sorry, seeds. Um, but they developed about 100 million years ago. So they weren't around before then. So the ancestors of our modern seagrasses are only 100 million years old, whereas your seaweeds are probably around the 400 to 600 million years old. And if you wanted to go back to their actual ancestors, they're about 2.3 billion years old. Yep. So that's the difference. You think about seaweeds as being, uh, you know, your kelps, your crayweed, um, those things, um, the browns developed around about 400 million years ago. Yeah. So the brown algae, the the ones you, you, you think of as kelps. And and they've just, you know, evolution made their way into the into the waters and out that's why they're so, you know, prominent in our inshore yes. coastline. So but sea seagrasses are actually tr uh, plants that have re evolved back into the salt water. And the really cool thing about seagrasses is during the Tethy Sea well, you know, 100 to 80 to 100 million years ago, they were very, very common in the sandy bottoms. Um, they still are. But we don't see the sort of speciation you see on terrestrial plants. Because it's such a, a specific sort of environment, it's quite easy to grow in the environment except for salt, light, mm. <laughs> and nutrients. Yeah, when you add them up, yeah, then it gets a little bit more difficult. And temperature. So it becomes difficult for a seagrass to persist. But what we see is only 72 species of seagrasses globally. And we see a lot of the, the seagrass genera being cosmopolitan. Now, what's unique about uh, Australia in general and West Australia specifically is just the level of diversity. So we were closer to the Tethy Sea, so we have more speciation and more species, around about 25 species, depending on which taxonomist you talk to, um, is the number of species we have on the West Australian coast, both tropical and temperate. And the highest area for species for seagrasses is the Coral Triangle, that area between the Philippines, Indonesia, Papua New Guinea that has the highest level of speciation of tropical reef fish, highest level of corals, the highest level of snails and vertebrates, etc. Well, West Australian coastline is not far behind. And in seagrasses, we match the biodiversity in that system for the seagrass. A researcher's dream. Yeah. So why leave home? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, you did, you did your travels early. So what about, just as, as we're talking about the impacts here, what about things like dredging? You know, one of the things that I have listened to and, and watched a lot of, particularly over in England and things like that, is this idea of commercial dredges and, and you know, the fact that we were dislodging seagrass um, intentionally, uh, in, in early days, I guess. Mm. But the reason that is such a problem is because seagrass can take so long to re-establish. They're not a, it's not a quick fix. So once it's dislodged, you need to re-establish that again. So can you chat us, chat us through this idea of, you know, A, dis, the dislodgement of seagrass, but then B, why that's such a problem, you know, because of the process that is required for them to, I guess, cement themselves back into the, to the seabed. So, so can we chat on that for a little bit? Yes, we can. Um, I, I think you've just opened up a can of worms. Mm. So how long have we got to... Oh, mate, we're here all day. <laughs> we're here all day. <laughs> okay, so, so there are, there's dislodgement during dredging, uh, which is called the, the immediate impact of the dredging activity. Then there's the near field and the far field effects of turbidity and dredging. As seagrasses really cannot deal with light being turned off um, for longer than about a month or two. Um, papers recently published on dredging suggest that dredging should only occur for a maximum of three months. Otherwise, you're looking at potential a local extinction of those species of seagrasses that are nearby in the, in the near field um, and potentially in the far field. We unfortunately dredge for periods of six months to a year and thus... Uh, dredging itself can be a major impact on seagrasses, especially if you don't manage the dredging uh, plumes. And that's been a major issue for us in the West Australian coastline. Now, recently we modelled all that, we came up with the conclusion that you've got to do your dredging in a time when the plants are basically stationary, and that's usually winter. You don't want to be dredging into spring because that's when fast growth occurs. And when you look at these plants, they're clonal. What does that mean? Your grass on your lawn is clonal. 
it grows little runners and then puts out leaves and runners and leaves that's exactly what seagrass do and um, uh, they have a high utilization of the, the photosynthesis and the products they build from photosynthesis from the sun but at the same time you turn the sun off you're basically they're starving so it's, it's just a matter of picking the times and looking at the cost the environmental cost when you plan a dredging program so if you're doing a a significant dredging program it's going to take two years to do how do you organize that such that you don't do it in a two-year block mm. and um and we have to basically make uh the conscious effort to protect environments because once they're lost they're very hard to replace this comes back to your restoration component we just finished studying all of the restoration programs that have happened in Coburn Sound that the uh, the bay just south of Perth uh, there are 110 programs since the 80s um, we were able to go revisit 31 of them of those 31 23 showed success but it's very hard to tell how much success in other words yes they're still there they're growing they're like natural meadows but uh, how, what is the total area of coverage we don't know because once they start to grow together it's really hard to tell so a paper came out recently that kind of went global viral and i think you had something to do with it but this idea that this particular meadow and i think it was off shark bay or maybe coburn Sound. you'll need to remind me but it was all one species. Yeah. And it I, was one individual. One individual. Yes. So, and I think this ties into what we're talking about on this idea that, uh, and I want to come back to it, you know, the difficulty for seagrass to re-establish itself. But then this idea that you mentioned there that they have runners, right? So, mm-hmm. so once you kind of get one, you know, I guess uh, secure population in place, it can expand from there. But getting that you know, getting that one, I guess, area to, to be a stronghold is probably the difficulty that, you know, you've faced. So why, just firstly, why is it so hard for seagrass to re-establish? What, what process actually happens once it's secured itself to the sand or the seabed? Or is that the hardest part, getting it to be stationary in the one spot, away from currents, away from tides, which is why Coburn Sound is so important? Well, Coburn Sound allows us to do that in that environment. Um, let's go back to the first thing you said. Mm. Yes, I, I was lucky. I, um, we had a, a project that was looking at reproduction in seagrasses. So we're looking at the seed production of seagrasses in Shark Bay. And we're asking the question, can we use crosses of different seagrasses to deal with the different sorts of environments that we're looking into for climate change? Can we make a thermally tolerant seagrass? We uh, thought we were working on multiple populations. We were sampling 13 locations down, up and down salinity gradients, depth gradients, and um, what we found was it was one individual. <laughs> right. <laughs> Which then I brought the question, how adaptable is this phenotype to extreme environments? Now, when you look at the history of, of why we have seagrasses in shark bay, it's really quite interesting I hope you don't fall asleep. Um, the, uh, about 8,000 years ago, the sea, uh, um, with uh, sea level rise, the sea started entering Shark Bay. It was quite deep, um, but the shallow banks developed through seagrass growth. And now, you know, you're looking at an area where you can stand in one and a half metres for about a third of the bay. So it's pretty on a low tide. It's that shallow. And that's all because the seagrasses have built these banks and sills off sand by capturing all the sand and accreting sand up to the surface. And the really interesting thing about that is um, that the, it, that system is a biologically produced geomorphic structure. And at some stage, about 4,000 years ago, the, it became an extreme environment. And we think that the polyploid, okay, what's a polyploid? We're diploid. So you and I, we have two complementary copies of our DNA, right? Tetraploid means they have four. So at some stage, this pot, the, the, the seagrass decided it was too difficult to live in that environment, but one of the individuals uh, um, basically duplicated its DNA because that was what, what was working. They didn't want to, uh, you know, uh, 
It just basically wanted to live. So plants do this quite often. They, you know, our hexaploidy is really common in wheat, for instance. Uh, all the wheat we eat is hexaploid or more. So, um, so you know, it's a, it's a tetraploid up there. The really cool thing about it, though, is that it's, de it's developed to deal with high and variable temperatures, so low lows and high highs. It's adapted to very extreme light environments, high light environments, not low. And it's adapted to an environment that has no phosphorus in it. <laughs> There's no dissolvable, measurable phosphorus in the system as you get into the high salinities. Um, and so it's the optimal plant to grow in an area that's changing temperature as fast as Shark Bay. Does that make sense? Yeah, so is, isn't that a good sign for the future? We're going to use that in, in uh, uh, those sprigs from that plant mm. in our restoration in Shark Bay. We are using that plant because the tests we've done, the science behind it all, is, ex ex is extensive and we believe that we can maintain and grow meadows of that particular genus and species up there just from that one single tetraploid clone. But it also means to me that with, if we do have a rise in temperature, you know, if the water levels, you know, if we do get a, a one or two degree uh, increase uh, across the board, which is, you know, I think what they're expecting by 2040, uh, yeah, 2040 or something like that, this mm -hmm. particular seagrass can tolerate that. Yeah. Which is great because if it was, you know, if, if there was a level of temperature where it couldn't, you know, couldn't survive, well, then we're in trouble in 100 years' time when, you know, they expect everything to to increase in temperature but that's so so the significance of that discovery for you what what, what was when i guess you know it was obviously a, a few months or a, a few years i guess in the making four years. four years in the making so what was the significance of that what's the one thing that you can take out of that and go right this is what we learned we now have the biggest cl individual plant in the world Right. We'll be beaten down by somebody else soon. But at the moment, that clone is 180 kilometres long. Wow. <laughs> and it leaves the aspen in, in Colorado for dead, So, which was the last biggest mm. clonal plant. Um, yes, we're making some assumptions there, but I think we can. Um, one. Two, we, we were looking for reproduction and for manipulating the outcome so we get the result. We don't have to worry about that now. So we've just saved ourselves eight years of research. Which is a lot. Which is a lot of money, which mm. is the more important thing. If you think about a couple of salaries over eight years, it Absol adds up to a lot of money. Absolutely. Um, and plus all the technology we use. The really cool thing is we have tested that Posidonia clone um, um, for a two-degree warmth warming and for a two-degree warming plus four-degree heat wave. So what happens if you add a heat wave to a two degree warming? Because everybody talks about slow incremental rise, but what we're seeing in the, in the global ocean is extreme events are increasing in frequency and intensity. So that's the secret for us. And so an extreme uh, uh, oceanographic event of five and a half degrees does cause some damage to that clone, but it still persists, it doesn't die. It's, it's, you know, for someone who's not in the industry, it's quite, it's quite, you know, difficult to get your head around that there is a single, you know, plant that is that, is that long. But it, I do remember when that media release came out and it was plastered all over the mainstream um, kind of media outlets and it was, it, uh, it was a big deal, I know, for, for your industry. Um, and it's cool to hear the story behind that, not just that, you know, the media release with a few quotes. It's cool to hear what it actually means going forward. Um, just before we get off the, uh, I guess, the issues, you know... The, the just one second. You, uh, you led with that p particular comment, but mm. you were asking me a different question. Mm. Do you remember what it was? Uh, the, the dislodgement yeah. and the difficulty in, in uh, yeah. seagrass re-establishing. Well, the, the issue really, if we look at the... Can I point yeah, to it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If we look at this beautiful um, painting um, by Angela Rosson of seagrasses in West Australia, you know, what you see here is potentially just a few clones, maybe five plants of, of seagrass because they much like your your meadow they grow and they grow um, out so uh, you know generally you find the clones in, in um, size is around about three to five meters in width in diameter um, for say Coburn Sound um, in Shark Bay it's kilometers so each individual clone is is up to 180 kilometers wide so um, that is geometric growth 
So what you do is you plant an individual and you, it doesn't uh, just grow linearly, it grows geometrically. So if you get one established, you will, after five years, have a meadow of hundreds of shoots and it might be one and a half metres wide. So that's what you've got to think about. It's not like you plant one and only one grows. You plant one and you have uh, thousands of shoots mm. in five years. And that's the nice thing about growing lawn, as we know, and growing seagrasses. It's the same thing. Is the difficulty in getting that one to stick there? Now, this is, this is where you hit the nail on the head. Can you imagine, when I, when I work underwater, I always tell people, because West Australia is very swelly, so you get lots of swell and motion underwater. Um, basically, when you're underwater, it's like working at the Reynolds numbers, the actual physics of working um, in air in a cyclone. Right. So water with you know, a, a knot of, of current or you know, swell coming over you all the time is, is the same Reynolds number because it's, it's got a different density. Water's much more dense than air um, as working in air in a cyclone. Wow. So when you think about that poor single shoot mm. that you've just planted, it's got to deal with all of that energy associated with water motion um, as well as persisting to grow the second shoot, the third shoot, and then the hundred shoots. I've never heard it put like that. That's what, that's what seagrass is trying to deal with by way of ocean currents and movement yeah. and tides is the equivalent of trying to plant a, a plant in a cyclone. Yeah. Wow. And, yeah. and why, why is that an issue then? It's obviously dislodgement, security, and keeping it there and, and allowing it to, you know, I guess, dig down with its roots and its rhizomes. You'll be able to explain that a little bit better. But, mm. but you know, anyone listening to this can imagine the, the strain that it would be under. So that's the difficulty that in getting that first one to stick? Yeah. So what we work with, I'd say, for instance, we do a lot of seed work. Seeds for snapper, let's mm. just say, I'm so proud to be a member of Ozfish working on seeds for snapper. It is a program that came out of 12 years of my life's research, and it's a program that's working beautifully. But guys, we're putting out a million seeds into the environment. Last year was a million, 1.2 million seeds went out into um, 2.3 hectares of sandy bottom. We are looking at losses in the first year that will result in less than 10% of those seeds creating seedlings. Within the second year, and uh, half of those will be lost again, so less than 5%. And in the third year, you'll lose half of them again. And why does it work? Because of clonal growth. Because clonality means the growth of shoots is, every, is geometric. So by the end of five years, you'll have as many shoots in few patches as you do the seeds you deli delivered. So in other words, you throw out a million seeds, you'll have a mil million shoots growing in the ground, but you won't have a million plants. Right. So d is that, a, I guess, is that a positive or a negative? So you, you talk about you throw out a million, you know, in the first year, half of them are gone, and then the second year, half again, and then... A bit more than the half, so first on. year. Yeah, first year. So, <laughs> yeah, right, so 10% in the first year. Sorry, only 10% survive in the first yeah. year. To me, that's a pretty low... You know, that's a low number, you know, but what's the positive behind that? Oh, okay. The first thing to realise is we're too busy thinking like humans. Like, when you have a baby, you don't have a, a million babies to have ten babies, do you? You no. have one baby and you want it to survive. You invest a lot of time in, uh, embry in the embryo developing. Mm. You invest a lot of time in the first two years of life. Now, that's called a type one survivorship curve. So a lot of investment early, a lot of death at the end. So all, you know, my age, we start falling off the perch and start looking like I do. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, but you know, the really cool thing is that all plants, as far as I'm concerned, this is my personal opinions, all plants do the opposite. They're type three. They invest in a huge uh, amount of, of juveniles that don't survive. And the curve goes like almost exponentially, it crashes basically boah, like that. Now, that's how plants grow. And it, unless you're growing them in your garden, and even then you lose a lot, you don't expect, um, you know, if you seed with natives, you don't expect all of the seeds to grow plants because that's not their life history strategy. 
We don't think like that. You just, appoint, that was a great demonstration. It doesn't matter. These plants, I've just recently done these numbers, so please, my mathematics, mm. as an ecologist, I would like to point out, my weakness is I keep adding zeros <laughs> to things. <laughs> and it's really funny because, uh, you know, uh, I have a team who will constantly remind me that I've added extra zeros, which is really good. But mm. if I didn't have the team, the numbers would be all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> but we just calculated the number of seeds produced in Coburn Sound, the minimum and the maximum seeds, right? The minimum amount of seeds from the worst site for producing fruit, flowers and fruit, is around about 20 million seeds a year. Guess what the other number is? Give you any idea how big that is? It's uh, 20 billion. Right. It is huge. So where we, where we sample, we collect a million seeds. That one location produces 10 million mm. seeds. We're taking a tenth of the seeds to use in seed-based restoration, of which a tenth will survive their first year, of which 1% will grow into an adult. Does it matter? No, because of geometric growth off the clone. I knew you were going to, in this interview, give us a gem or two, and I think we've just found the first one. <laughs> I love being able to respond particularly to critics or sceptics of restoration, right? And I think it's natural, but, it, you know, people see all this work being done and money invested into it, and the natural question they have is, well, why are you going to do all that if, if you know, only 10% are going to survive in the first year and so on and so on? And, and I must admit, you know, I was probably a, a part of that group um, that, that thought that for a long time before, you know, being introduced to it all. But your explanation there of humans compare themselves to humans and how we do it as opposed to how nature does it is brilliant and i think it's something that uh, one of the takeaways i want to get from this episode is this idea that we invest a lot of time for a high success rate but uh you know a pretty high death rate mm -hmm. whereas seagrass for example is flipped they spread themselves as far and as wide as possible, knowing that only a small percentage will survive. But the, the more they spread themselves, because it's a percentage-based business, the more seeds you get that are surviving. I think that is brilliant and something that really clarifies something not just for me, but for someone listening that might originally have heard your, you know, y y you explaining how many of the seeds in Seeds for Snapper actually, you know, survive. But when you put it into perspective, that's actually quite a lot. Um, I think I think that's a, a, a big takeaway, particularly from, and we're going to get more into the restoration techniques and methods shortly. Um, so just to just to wrap that up, seeds for snapper, um, even at our worst site. So we we go out and we test sites with seeds for snapper, and if it doesn't work, we don't reseed, right? We don't go back to that area mm. again um, because there's so much out there. We um, in terms of habitat that's been uh, lost seagrasses that we can do that for many years until we find the right environments. Um, what we're finding, and this is the take home message for every volunteer, is that we are finding that the whole Coburn Sound is what they call supply limited in techniques. And what that means is that there's not enough seeds getting into the system to actually colonise. By us going down there and casting our seeds off the boat, we're increasing the total number of seeds and the seed density on the bottom to a point where we're seeing from zero survivors of a natural process of settlement to 5 to 10%. So, you know, it's 5, 10, one of our sites is 20% more young juveniles growing in that environment than ever was there before. Um, so, you know, it, it's, um, sorry, I said 20%. See what I mean by numbers? Yeah. 200%. Not 20. I need to fix the zeros <laughs> in your mouth. <laughs> yeah. I, I can honestly say, uh, I don't know how I, I've survived as an academic as long mm. as I have. <laughs> I'm going to throw zeros on, the, on your age. <laughs> could, could, get really, could get really confusing. Yeah. Well, I won't. I, won't, I, I think there's a bit of assumed knowledge here, and we, we do apologise for those listening that don't know what Seeds for Snapper is. Let's have a quick, you know, we're here now, and we'll take a quick break shortly, but Seeds for Snapper, you're, you're talking about the success rate. Now, let's talk about the actual principle behind 
the program, right? So mm. like all good podcasts, you know, we just follow a route and we get there. So we've <laughs> arrived here now. Let's let's deal with it. So the program you're talking about has been going on. We're, we're entering the sixth year now in 2023 or 2022, 2023. It runs across uh, the Christmas period, right? So it does technically jump jump um, into to different years. But essentially, it's a community based uh, restoration program um, that uh, is a partnership between uh, Ausfish Unlimited, which is a, a non for profit uh, habitat conservation. Um, organisation that looks to protect and restore habitat in Australia, uh, the University of Western Australia, and and your um, Marine Institute, um, which which you've been kind of leading or, or, or figureheading for for a while now. And there's plenty of other corporate partners that have assisted throughout the course of that program. But essentially, what you're referring to is this idea that of, of volunteers. I guess collecting, and you'll be able to clarify this for me shortly. But collecting the seeds that would have otherwise been dislodged and lost to ocean currents, like you're referring, referring to before with this, you know, cyclone analogy, uh, and, and not being able to settle. And if mm-hmm. they can't settle, then, you know, there's, there's no restoration going on, no ge- re- uh, regeneration. So volunteers will go out with these, you know, special nets. Um, they, they look like you might be collecting butterflies, if that makes sense, if you're out in the, uh, in the garden. Collect as many seeds as they can, dislodge seeds, take them back to the shore. And these are divers, um, mainly divers, but, you, you know, in, in other parts of Australia, we can do it by a beach combing. Uh, boaters can go out and assist uh, in certain areas. Um, and you'll place those seeds in tanks. Now, these tanks, and this is what I'm keen to hear a bit um, from you about, is, is why these tanks are set up the way they are to mimic a certain natural phenomenon that would happen with these seeds. Anyway, those seeds will eventually drop to the bottom. We can collect those, and then we give them to recreational anglers and, and you know, uh, I guess water users generally to go spread those seeds in strategic areas that will allow for those seeds to settle down where they should be, you know, they were originally going to be lost, but now they can settle down, uh, limited ocean currents, limited tidal areas, I guess, to then start their process. I, I, I've tried to summarise that the best I can, but I'm sure you'll have things to add. Well, you've done a really good job. I'd like to point that out. Um, uh, we, I'd like to tell the whole story here. Yeah, please do. Please do. Um, I um, have been working on a range of restoration approaches for a long time. Since 2004, um, we started looking at nurseries for seeds. So we would collect the fruit, get the seeds, plant the seeds, grow them out for nine to 12 months, and then put them out in the environment. And we did that from 2008 to 2010 and decided that we were spending a lot of money, huge amount of effort in, in just energy alone to keep these plants growing. And then we put them out. They're little small things. I would put in this cyclonic type Reynolds number, and they were gone or we put them out in sheltered waters and the crabs came along and because they're young and tasty, they ate them all. So we, we were looking at a lot of, well, we can do this, a nursery type approach like we do with terrestrial plants, like we do when we're, we're restoring parts of terrestrial environments and it was unsuccessful. So John and I, my colleague John Statton and myself decided that we were gonna give it up. We're gonna just put the seeds out and take the loss, the loss I've just described to you, that exponential loss of, from seed to first year seedling to to a whole plant. Now, so we, you know, I, I, let's just say that this has been a big change in my life. The big change has been I always thought technology was the answer to solution, uh, environmental solutions, and now I've decided that technology is a answer, but without community involvement and community engagement and acceptance um, and thus votes uh, we are going just to create lots of technologies that don't get used. So in the last 15 years, I've really embraced the concept of getting community um, involved with pre- uh, basically giving back uh, to nature. I hate to use that sentence, but that's a good sentence. Giving back to nature for all the stuff we take from it. Um, and so that, that's basically a change in my attitude. In 19, uh, um, what was it, 2018, we were presenting our results of the technology development for uh, seed-based restoration to the Department of Environment at the time um, in Canberra. And uh, it was a big program. We talked about you know, all sorts of restoration. One of them was seagrass. And Craig came up to me afterwards and said, 
and he's the CEO of, of your organisation. Founder Ospridge. and CEO, Craig Copeland, yeah. Yeah, Craig Copeland was... He came to a, 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 at the bar, actually, was buying a, a beer. Where the, best, where the best work happens. <laughs> and he got excited. And I brought John Statton up and I said, come on, John, listen to this. And we started the program that year. Now, the initial issue was money, <laughs> uh, people. Uh, how do we start this? And it's taken us up to the fifth year to get to a point where I feel it's, it's, it's like a standalone Ausfish activity. We supply the technology, but it's really run by the community. Every aspect of it is run by the community and the team you've got over in WA. Um, so uh, that's a really cool thing for me is that I've watched something grow from being quite small, small impact. I can send you a slide showing you the increase in the effort and the number of seats we've dis distributed for you, if you would like to use that. But we've gone from literally a 1,000 seats a year to 1.23 million seats. You know, put that in context. That is what community can do, and we've done it in five years. We're coming into our sixth year. Um, it's going to be huge. Now, what do we do? Okay, seats for snapper, what is it? So really, it's a three-step process. It's not hard. We collect the fruit, not the seeds. We collect fruit from the plants um, when, when they're ripe or from the water column or from the beach. We put them into large tanks, which are really just um, fisheries type tanks with sloping bottoms. Um, and the fruit float on the surface and ripen. They get hot, they split, drop the seeds, we scoop them up, we put them into little baggies, count them all, everything's counted. Uh, we probably can't do that into the future because we're getting too many put them in the little baggies, and we then, um, Dom takes them down to the local boat ramp, convinces individuals to go put them out, or we take them out ourselves. And we do have delivery days where we actually hire a boat, a, a commercial boat, to go out and see um, with, the, uh, with the volunteers. So what, what's, the, what's the science behind it? What's the benefit, benefit behind <laughs> distributing seeds in this fashion and, and in the areas that you've chosen. So a lot of people will go, oh, that's great. You know, I want to get involved because I want to get out in nature and the mental health benefits of being out there. But there'll be others that will go, well, is this really working? And I, I want you to kind of address them now. This is your chance to go, yes, this is working or yes, you know, we think this is working. Where are we at? Do we know Seeds for Snapper is benefiting the seagrass uh, populations? Okay, so in brackets, mm. I'll give you another graph. It is working. Um, and it's working in, um, in an environment that's quite in, in, in quite polluted. So if you've ever dived in Coburn Sound, it's not the nicest place to go for your dive. Um, it's a bit like diving in Sydney Harbour, I expect. Right. <laughs> Don't want to do that. <laughs> um, and it has the same scary things under the water. Like you guys suffer bull sharks, mm. we suffer great white sharks. So there you go. Same sort of same sort of environment. Um, uh, what what is really working in the program is that we are getting that one to ten percent return off whole large plants, and we've documented that over the last six and a half years. That's been the technology and the monitoring of the technology. We're, we've gone beyond monitoring technology. We are now in the process of creating new meadows. We're going to get to a point where we cannot monitor the work we do. It's going to get that big. Now, when that happens, we're going to have to have some belief that we're being effective. We've got the evidence to show it is effective at the moment. How much belief do you need? Mm, well, I mean, the ten percent's enough for me. Yeah. If 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 if, if you say yep, yeah, we are making a difference because at the moment we've recorded enough data in the first five years, and and if that gets unmonitorable, then that's a win too. But I guess five years is enough of a time period for you to be confident and if you're confident then I think everyone else is confident you've got more experience than everyone else but I think that's a really important part of any restoration program is to have someone being able to confidently say this is working and and at times there'll be people that might say well we don't know if it's working yet but someone's got to try but you know you're at a point now where you can confidently say this is working so just to uh, add to this I um so have, like I said, I've just been studying 110 programs mm. that have run from 1980, in the 1980s right through the present time in Coburn Sound alone. Um, off those programs, I would say 90% of them are too small. Mm. So in other words, they're not really restoring anything. They're experimenting on the techniques and the technology and the methodology and how to improve the methodology. 
they're not addressing what is needed now, which is actually not science. It's planting. It's growing. Yeah. It's agriculture. It's getting out there and doing something um, for the environment. They do set up that in that the, our capacity to be confident in an outcome, but I, I think we spend far too much time looking into the future and looking for the past to give us answers for the present. These programs are about getting involved now for all the values, and yes, one of them is restoration. Yeah. The other one, the most important one for me is just I get underwater with a scuba tank and a funny net. And all of a sudden, I'm zenned out. You know, I'll mm. be down there and people will be tapping me on the shot. Gary, it was only an hour. Yeah. <laughs> get out. And I'm like, oh. Because I get this, what is it called? This boost of, uh, you know, um, you know, hormones mm. that really, really works in my case. Serotonin me, kick of some sort. Yeah. yeah. And everybody gets it. Mm. People say, I never swim in seagrass meadows because it's all boring. It's just leaves, right? They go out with us and they come back and go, whoa, mm. I saw this and, oh, that was so cool. I'm coming back tomorrow. Why? Because it's a whole mental health community involvement thing. And we don't, we don't put a value on that. We're too busy doing the cost estimates rather than the benefit estimates. So in your time, you've said you've looked at, you've spent a long time looking at a lot of the trials, let's call them trials, that, that aren't big enough to talk to, you know, give the name a program, I guess. What are some of the other techniques that we've tried in Australia in the last few decades that, that never worked or we don't know if they're going to work? You know, obviously, Seeds for Snapper is, is one way of doing it, one that you're very passionate about and you kind Sorry. of yeah, <laughs> manufactured. But, but what's, what's some other ways? You know, I've heard of sandbags. I've spoken to, to Jason Tanner in South Australia and he's dropping 20,000 plus sandbags in a deployment. Um, and he's kind of given us uh, his explanation that those sandbags are acting as an anchorage point for amphibolus, which require, uh, you know, basically an, an anchorage to... to pin themselves onto and then that's how they grow from there uh obviously you can transplant and and you know quite literally do some gardening underwater but you know the the criticism there is that it's slow and you need individuals and, and manpower to to get un underwater and do that can you run us through some of the things that you've studied the, the benefits of them and the th maybe the things that haven't worked okay so I'll, I'll start with saying that most methods have some success somewhere now, the old sprig method where you go out, you get a leading edge to, from a seagrass meadow and you transplant it to your restoration site. There's a three hectare zone down on Southern Flats in Coburn Sound that was transplanted that way. Community, if you run community, it costs somewhere between, in US dollars, um, oh geez, I'd say um, somewhere between 16 and $32,000 a hectare US dollars. Um, uh, it costs to do that commercially somewhere around ten, uh, you know, sixty to eighty thousand dollars to over hundreds of thousands of dollars, depending on you know uh, conditions and the accessibility of plants and time. So commercially, it's an expensive business, but recreationally, even planting sprigs has a value. And if you get a team together who really love it, and we have had a team up at the um, uh, useless Loop Salt Works up in Shark Bay. We've just recently transplanted a hectare of seagrass with that, that crew, and we did it in two trips, about six days each of diving. Right, so, so and that was quite literally transplanting. We, like the, the <laughs> pulling them up, yep. planting them. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> it sounds silly, but it works, and it's one of the the methods that has most success. It's too small. You can't do a hundred. You can't do the number of hectares lost in a day that way. But it's a great way to set up nucleation sites, as I described before. You plant a hectare, and you come back five years later, and you don't just have five hectares. You have more than five hectares. So it, it's an exponential growth, and as the plants grow, they reproduce and grow and mm. keep on going. That's that that geometric growth um, pattern. Um, so. We were really impressed that we could do that. It shocked us. <laughs> yeah. Well, small scale, but still effective. Yeah. Now, so there's a couple of examples of hectare scale ch changes. The real cost to that, and when it doesn't work, it doesn't work at all. 
So uh, it is uh, planting sprigs, they have greater success than planting seeds or dispersing seeds. Um, but at the same time, it, it, it is very uh, labour intensive. Now, if you go from that to the, the bags that uh, Jason Tanner uses, have you looked at how long he's been doing that? Yeah, a long time. Which long is, time. You know, you, you've got to, I guess, respect the the dedication to the yeah. to the cause. But I'm interested. So, you so, so just just to make that point, mm. Jason, like myself, um, and John Statton, were very uh, very concerned that people keep making that statement you made before. Oh, where's your evidence? Mm. This is going to work. Where's your evidence? If he had stopped when they said where's your evidence he would not have done the almost 20 years of experimentation that's gone into those sandbags now he can plant a huge number of sandbags and guarantee a success because but he continued on because he didn't listen to that you can't do it yep and uh, you know that's human endeavor in my view that's what we we're really aiming for and jason is a great example of standing in, in the no in the no it's not possible standing in that space for long enough that he actually has the outcome he expected. And that's what you want to do with seeds, right? Seeds for exactly. Santa, right? So you fight, you're, you're six years in, or the team's six years in, yeah. Jason is 20 plus in. You know, if we do seeds for 20 years, two decades, then who knows the amount of data, you know, you might get and who knows the amount of, res- you know, the type of response you can give to a critic because you've done it for that long and you persisted. So it's not the critic that's important. You will have 100 hectares or yeah, yeah, hundreds yeah. of hectares of seagrass and you will have worked against the, the causes of loss. So, you know, it's not just dealing with the cause. It's mm. also dealing with how you're going to respond to that cause. And if a community is out there planting seagrass, there's no cause that's going to get in the way of, the, you know, the causing loss to that. Yep. So you're building a community of practice. You're building a group of individuals, as Jason has done with you guys. Um, you know, Jason's uh, been very instrumental in in assisting Ozfish in West in in uh, South Australia, South Australian Adelaide waters, um, with the ideas. And you guys are approaching seeds very different than we we are in this coast. Yeah, I like that. There's I like that the two different sister programs have their different ways of doing it, but you know both equally is I guess beneficial to the particular environments that they're in. So you've spoken about transplants, you've spoken about dispersion of seeds, we've spoken about uh, sandbags. Is there any other ones that you know we should chat about, or are they the three kind of internationally recognised ways to restore seagrass? Well, we've also done, in Coburn Sound, we've done the sods, where you go out like a lawn, you just cut a sod out of the seagrass meadow and you take it over and you plant it where it, where it wasn't. Uh, sods are incredibly expensive. I can imagine. <laughs> I can imagine. Well, uh, when this program was going, it was in the mid-90s. So these prices are mid-90s. To build the equipment cost $2 million. Right. And it was... I'm going to get the number wrong. No, I'm not. 8,000. Don't add a zero. No, no, I took it off. (laughs) $8,000 per day in commercial divers. Because the machinery had large, sharp blades, completely unprotected, slamming into the bottom, cutting out sods, putting them on trays. They needed to have commercial divers down there. Not, it's nothing uh, we can do as a community because it's way too dangerous. It's like working in a factory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what's, the, what's the success rate on something like that? Did we ever trial it enough to know? Yes, yeah, so that trial went on for four years, five years. Um, and in that time, about, about 40% of the sod survived. So on average, somewhere between 40 and 60%, depending on which mm. line you looked at. But you could say on average, if you include all the losses, about 40% survived. The really interesting thing is they grow square. They don't grow round. So you've got these square sods some 26 years later that are square. Mm. They're much more expanded. You know, They were planted as probably just about 0.6 of a square metre, and they're now covering um, almost or I'd say probably five metres square, so that's 25 square metres, but they're square. That is bizarre. Yeah. Why are they growing <laughs> why square? Well, no one knows. Oh, well, we think it's got to do with the, the rate of expansion versus branching that goes on. Hmm. Sorry, this is getting very technical. I love it. 
so the amount the rhizome branches versus the amount it spreads. So if it was spreading more, it would break the shape up more, but it's actually branching and branching and branching, so it's keeping the shape as it keeps growing. Right. And it's only growing, you know, expanding little bits at a time. Now, the really cool thing about that method is it's very effective with wave-swept environments. It is not an effective tool or, nor an, uh, cost-effective in any way in a sheltered environment. So it was trialled on Success Bank, which it gets the northerly swells. And, you know, WA is famous for its winter swells from South Africa. <laughs> and these sods survive, whereas you put a sprig down, you've lost it straight away. You mentioned at the outset of the podcast, which ties into what you've just said, you know, you spent a lot of time in different countries and you just spent a lot of time in different areas. You might not in those areas have been looking at seagrass, but I can only assume in the last, you know, 40 years, you, you have done some travels around to different areas and, and seen how different countries and people are doing it. One thing I always like to get an understanding of is where does Australia sit in terms of other countries and what we're doing about this problem, right? So as an analogy, uh, America does the Billion Oyster Project, right? So they're leading shellfish restoration in Australia, uh, sorry, in the world. And they have been doing for a long, long time. But, but some of the stuff that we're doing in Australia now is we're, we're hot on their heels, which is really, you know, I like hearing that any time Australia's on the world stage, you kind of have a fist pump, right? Where do we sit in terms of seagrass restoration? Are we a credible voice on the international stage when it comes to what we're doing or are we miles miles away? And, and who are some of the other countries, if any, that are showing us how to do it? Great question. I love it. <laughs> it's, it's one of those questions... Uh, it's typically an Australian, how good are we doing against yeah, the world? Be, let's go, <laughs> yeah. you're guilty. Yeah. Yeah. Well, guilty, but really quite, quite a good question. We are behind the US, but I, I, very quickly catching up. Right. And uh, we are lucky because our environments are less impacted than the Northern Hemisphere. So the Danes, for instance, have been doing, and the Swedes and the Norwegians have been playing around with restoration in big scale um, most recently, and they're struggling because the environment is so impacted. It's not the fact you can't grow the seagrass. It's just that you don't have enough environment to grow it in. What environment are you referring to there? Sheltered the, waters. Sheltered waters. And, you know, they're, they're dealing with light um, issues. They're dealing with uh, basically sediment issues where you've got toxins in the sediment that are re-released as oxygen de de depletes that are phytotoxins or plant toxins. Um, they uh, have trialled multiple methods with no success in the, in the native sediments. So they've started to do sediment capping using dredging programs. Um, that's got some success with it. This, that's the Danes. The Swedes have had more success because their waters are clearer, but they're still playing around with waters that are almost fresh during winter and the high, you know, saline seawater during summer. So they're struggling a bit with the physiology of the plants the fins are really interesting. That they're doing very well with their restoration, but um, it's all very small scale. Right. So nothing so, industrial yet. Nothing. And America, except you, you mentioned in America. Yeah. So now, what are they doing? Now the reason I got really interested in seeds was because of a, a guy who I know is JJ. His name is Robert Orth. Where uh, does JJ come from? What a ridiculous nickname. <laughs> well, I did tell him um, uh, where I thought it came from and he nearly hit me, right. so I won't go any further. <laughs> so I got it wrong in the first place. <laughs> he's very uh, he's a person who gets up at 5 o'clock in the morning to lift weights. Okay. He's 75 years old. He's got more metal in him than he's got a bone. Mm. You know, he's... Yeah, you're painting a good picture. Yeah, <laughs> JJ. JJ. Yep. Um, and JJ um, is one of my mentors. It's really funny. Uh, in 19... 95, I was at a workshop and presented a view for the future of seagrasses in Owen Anchorage and Coburn Sound and a complete alternative way the process has been impacted in them. And that was, you know, we're at a point now where we can restore. We're at a point now where we know the ecological value of these things. What does the future look like? The future is determined by the policy and the community. And uh, JJ loved it, so he invited me to this international workshop. It was called NCEAS, and that's the National Center for Ecological Analysis and Synthesis that sits in Santa Monica. Um, and what a all, mouthful. And all it is is we get together 
two years in a row, every six months, and we summarise and assess and evaluate what is the value of the research out there in terms of managing a problem. And our problem was the fact that seagrasses were completely hidden from people as an environment that's being lost, a bit like mangroves. Um, and we looked at, well, what is the loss? And out of that workshop came the numbers 7% loss per annum globally of seagrasses, which was published in 2009. Uh, but what that gave me the opportunity to do was to sit down and go, well, where do I want to send my effort? Do I want to look at all the losses and woe is me? You hear scientists talk about coral reefs, woe is me, right? Mm. Not useful. Most people just have heard too much of that. Climate change. It's here, guys. Be real. No, nah, people are too busy hearing the woe is me and not really getting into action. Yeah. Well, clearly, what we found was seagrasses are under threat. Man, seriously under threat. And not just in the developed world, mostly in the undeveloped world. So um, that sort of gave me the energy and the, effort, the efforts I've put into seagrass restoration have come from that. And that came from the USA in... 2006, so you can see how far ahead they are from us, from that. JJ Orth, at the same time, was doing this wonderful experiment. People said it could not be done. The seagrasses in the coastal embayments of Virginia, Maryland, you know, all the way up the coast, New York State, etc., were, were in the bad way, and most of it was lost during a, an outbreak of a, a disease that happened in the 30s was all wiped out and seagrasses weren't recolonising. So JJ went and got some seeds, threw them out one, one day and they grew and out of that came a 20-year program that's re recovered thousands of what they call acres but thousand, thousand hectares of seagrass from the effort put into about 70 acres. So what's that, about 30 hectares. Of, uh, so they, they seeded 30 hectares, they've got 1,000 hectares from it. Mm. So that's that geometric growth thing again. I think I've also heard that in America, one of the biggest things was hurricanes ripping out whole populations of seagrass, which we don't really get here in Australia. But I, I remember I've actually looked into the Virginia program you're referring to, and, and the disease was one, but I think the, this hurricane had a lot to do with it too, yeah. something that we don't deal with. Uh, a lot, but I'm sure they do. Because, we do. Well, we cyclones, cyclones, particularly up north in places like Marillion Harbour and um, mm. up in Darwin, which is you know there is a program happening up there around uh, transplants, believe it or not, because of a, a cyclone in 2009, which is it's yeah I guess funny, but we're referring to the west coast here at the moment. Yeah. Um, and, and I guess so. The interesting thing in the USA is they they basically made sure the legislation in various states covered the protection of seagrass. So in Florida, if you strand your, your recreational boat on a seagrass meadow and you've got to be rescued, you have to pay a fine to the government to replace the amount of seagrass lost, mm. right? As a recreational user. So it's not you're not talking about mining companies or no. wharfs or breakwaters or you know you're talking about a, a, a boaty or a fisher going yeah, you out. You get caught, you get a fine, and that fine goes into a pool that then looks after seagrass restoration in the tropics or subtropics in Florida. Mm. Um, and they have lots of good examples of successes. They also came up with a methodology where they determine all of the water in the tropics there was too low in nutrients. So instead of planting seagrass. They put bird stakes out and the cormorants land on the and poo into the water around the bird stakes. And the bird stakes then grow, the seagrass grow under the bird stakes. And Very cool. Out. So um, a colleague of mine, Jim Forkrian, came up with that idea when he was doing his PhD many years ago and with, um, with a group of people. And that's become the method for, for restoration for the Florida Keys. Wow. <laughs> what, a, what a nuanced technique, one yeah. that you would never... Yeah. You know, so it you'd won't never work think if of. you've got too much nutrients, though. Mm. Yeah, exactly. So, okay, so on, on the international stage, we're, we're, we're not far behind the world leaders in the US. Plenty of other countries doing, you know, I guess their thing. We haven't even touched on, and we'll, we'll take a quick break here, um, acknowledging that you can only sit in a chair for so long, I guess. But I really want to get to 
Are there any international policies, treaties, conventions, any major movements, particularly in the last few decades, that have, have acknowledged seagrass? You know, yeah. like, and, and, and we'll round that out there for and take a quick break. But, you know, is there anything, you know, in the international law, when coming from a legal background myself, I know it's international law's <laughs> means nothing anyway but you know at least there's an acknowledgement there so is there any recognition on the world stage from a from a i guess a treaty perspective in in seagrass or is it not that we're not there yet we're not in in uh, we do have a, a seagrass day international seagrass day yeah of course um which is only just recent and it was f- uh, pushed through the un by sri lanka interesting so you know we, as a as a group of uh, seagrass researchers we found the best venue to push it through and we've got our seagrass day um don't ask me the day <laughs> it comes up on my my, my uh, facebook mm, I'd, be, I'd be more concerned if you knew the day <laughs> it's a little bit too <laughs> esoteric <laughs> yeah um for me the biggest changes in in uh, legislation especially in international law has been this whole focus on is there a market for accumulated carbon under seagrass meadows and mangrove sw- uh, swamps and salt marshes and one of our uh, uh, world leaders slash uh, australian leaders peter mccready has made it, built a career on looking at these environments and and talking about well what could be a market um i i'm for my sins restoration and building carbon markets work hand in hand and therefore, I'm involved in various bits and pieces of, of research. More recently, and this is what really excites me, I, Seas for Snapper was the biggest community activity I was involved in for a while. And then out of the blue, I got involved with a company that of Mulgana. So the Mulgana are the um, traditional owners of Gatagudu or Shark Bay. Um, and... But I got involved with a Mulgana company um, called Tidal Moon. And Tidal Moon came to us and said, we need to find another way to employ our divers for more than five months of the year because they, they're a fishing company and they collect uh, sea cucumbers uh, sustainably under Mulgana uh, uh, elder um, legislation. They, they look mm. after it and uh, they're going to basically farm sea cucumbers. Now, sea cucumbers... Uh, known as trepang and uh, trepang sells for about two thousand dollars a dry ton i'm oh, sorry dry kilo <laughs> right so which is quite significant it's a significant um in, uh, amount of money mm. so um it, uh, we came up with a con- conclusion that we needed to form another company called tidal moon environmental and in tidal moon environmental we do seagrass restoration to try and return um, some hectares to the 1,000 square kilometre loss of seagrasses that occurred during the 2011 heat wave. So it's really getting into its jobs on country, regionally, for Indigenous people. And um, it's through a company, not through a corporation. So you, the problem with uh, a lot of Indigenous corporations is there's money for people to do things, but it's sort of seen by those that do it is they don't take responsibility for the action they take responsibility for being there and uh, this is a great it's an indigenous company it's their company it's all based in denim and they can see an outcome that would bring a full-time community of people working in the marine sphere that are the new middle class for indigenous australians what do you think the role is in, in all habitats, but particularly seagrass? Do you think there is an inherent understanding from our First Nations people here in Australia about seagrass that we will never, and I've been mean we as in me, yourself and I, um, assuming you have no, um, I guess, First, First Nation heritage? I don't. Yeah, nor do I. So do you think that they have an inherent understanding of these habitats that we will just never know? Um they do the same thing scientists do, but they've done it for thousands of years, mm. and they've used, uh, you know, let's let's be honest, all civilizations and all communities are anthropocentric. So, um, but the nice thing about indigenous communities is they built the natural environment into their belief structures. So, uh, when I go on country in in Mulgana country, and I go with elders, 
it's a learning curve for me. We have done projects with the Mulgana Ranges since 2018 on seagrass restoration as collaborations, not as we want to pay you for the job, but as here's, here's your share of the grant, here's my share of the grant, let's get on with it. What do you think we should do? What are the most important things for the Mulgana community? And um, that's really, I, th- I suppose, really changed my, my, uh, my view of how I do my science. I did the same when I was up in the Kimberley. We worked with the Bardi Jawi Rangers, and the Bardi Jawis, I said, I want to go do A, B, and C, and they laughed at me, and they said, well, two things, crocodiles, tides. How are you going to manage them, Gary? I go, I don't know. You guys know what you're doing. They said, okay, we'll design it for you. And we went out and we did their project. <laughs> right. Because <laughs> why? They've got thousands of years of experience. Mm. And when we talk about climate change, um, you can cut this out, but um, when we talk about climate change, there's a movie that's, come, that's going to have the world premiere that's been made by a, a, a young woman from West Australia. Um, but it's going to feature um, Uncle Noel Nanup from the, from the Noongar talking about they being the first climate refugees. So when we think about climate change and sea level rise and fall, we think about uh, that in a context of a modern phenomenon. Mm. But we're talking about 8,000 years ago, the sea being out the other end of Rottnest and all of that country being country. Mm terrestrial land that our indigenous um, um, f- um, colleagues used to use. Unbelievable when you think uh, of it like that. Yeah. And Uncle Noel was just like, yeah, you, got, you can learn so much from us. What did we do, guys? Mm. We moved off the coast. But we moved tens of kilometres off the coast. And we had to do it multiple times over, uh, since the time that Noel and I have been living on the coast. So 35, 40,000 years ago, there's been multiple incursions and, and off the sea in that time period. And I think there's a, this is why we need to sit down with elders, sit down with TOs and talk with them. And secondly, I think this idea of a regional uh, growth of economy around conservation, restoration, is just brilliant. This episode of Auscast is proudly supported by Wreckfish West, Water Corporation, Synergy, the Coburn Sounds Power Boats Club, the University of Western Australia, and BCF, Boating, Camping, Fishing.